Well, today we're in the fourth part of our series, and we took a little break last week because Pastor Anita was here, and she, she had a message for us, and, um, but we're in the fourth part of our five-part series called In the Fight, and we began this series, we introduced this series by looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and Paul's letter to the Ephesians when he was talking about putting on the full armor of God. And what he was talking about there was, essentially he was telling the Ephesians that they are in this fight, that they are in this battle, and he's telling us all as well, that we are in this battle, that we are not in a, a battle against people, but we are in a battle against um, principalities and authorities, the dark world and the spiritual forces, and against the devil's scheme. And, and Paul made this point about who we are fighting against. So as we've been looking at throughout this series, what we've been looking at is the people who were basically working for God, the people that God used, some of, some of the more popular characters in Scripture, and we saw how they had these struggles. We saw how Elijah became overwhelmed and how he was just, just got to the point where he just cried out to God and says, I've had enough. And we also looked at Paul as he was proclaiming God's message as he was, he was evangelizing and, and preaching that was he was speaking the truth how he was stoned and, and thought dead and drug out of the city and left there for dead and when the disciples came around and prayed around him how he got up and he went back in to the city and then left the next day. So we're looking at all these different characters, and today we're in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is not a, a book that is referred to a lot, and it might, it might be probably one of the, the least read books of Scripture, but in the book of Judges is the story of Samson and Delilah. And Samson and Delilah are popular characters. This is something that we, we hear. It's almost synonymous with like Romeo and Juliet and Samson and Delilah and, and you know these, these couples and, and these love songs and stuff like that. And uh, so we all heard of Samson and Delilah. And we might have known, we've, we've often heard you know, phrases about the, the strength of Samson. He had the strength of Samson and that. So Samson was a strong guy. And uh, so we're, we're going to take a look at Samson, but Samson was also flawed in character, just like all of us. Elijah, Paul, everyone that God uses is flawed in character. God uses flawed people. So today we're looking at the story of Samson and Delilah, and Samson was in a constant fight with the Philistines, but he was always victorious because of his great strength, until one day... When he gave up and gave in to Delilah's constant nagging, as he put it, that wore him out. And it said that he, he became sick to death. So I can only imagine how bad this nagging has gotten. Because most of us know what it's like when somebody nags you. You know, whether it's your, your parents growing up, or whether it's your spouse, or a friend, or, or, or someone... We know sometimes we're a boss or, or something. We know what it's like to be nagged. And it says that Samson got to the point where he just had enough with the nagging. And it, it got to the point where he just gave up. So now have you ever came to the point where you just wanted to give up? Where you just, where you just felt that you couldn't go on any longer? You just couldn't keep fighting anymore? Did you ever stop to ask? Did you ever stop to examine and say, what led to, to this point? What happened when you reached that point? Did you give up and give in? Or did you fight on? How did you come to your decision to give up? Or how did you come to your decision to fight on? <coughs> I know someone who had a struggle with addiction for a very long period of time. And this person, who I knew, thought I thought they were over this. But it turned out that this person had been living what most of us would consider a double life. This person was 
you know, by day um, on drugs, and the rest of the time on the weekends and some nights he was involved with the church. So he had his 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 feet in both worlds, and this we found out was going on for years. And this person said that they would pray every day that the Lord would take the addiction away from them. And it just seemed that it wouldn't go away. And this person kept it secret, kept it hidden, because this is not the kind of thing that you're going to go broadcasting. But sometimes I believe that you need to confide in someone. You need to talk to someone because you're in a fight, you're in a struggle. But like most people, they felt they could handle it themselves. That they were going to get over this and they were just going to keep praying about it. But sometimes God puts people in our lives for a reason. God wants us to lean on one another. God wants us to be held accountable. And from what I can tell, this person has completely at this point given themselves over to their addiction. Walking away from those who would keep them accountable. I think this person still goes to church, but if this person continues to go down their current path, it will simply be a matter of time. So I believe this person will completely walk away from God. From my point of view, this person has given up the fight and has given in to their addiction. And that their addiction basically is the source of their strength. This is, the, this is where they find whatever it is they have. This person has lost a great deal in their life. This person lost their, their family. This person has been to jail. This person has been... Um, you know, you know uh, had, had difficulties with the law, lost their house, you know, lost a lot of things, but continues in the struggle. Now, I know that there are a lot of variables and different perspectives when it comes to the issue of addiction, and I don't want to simplify this issue, but I know others who have not given up and have continued fighting. There are two pastors that I know that if you knew them today, when you know them today as who they are today, when you hear their story, you have a really hard time believing that this is the same person. I know one was involved in drugs and alcohol, and uh, the other one was involved in gambling. The one was in involved in gambling to the point that he became a bookmaker. And this is what led to his demise. He got caught in this, and... He ended up spending uh, an extended period of time in prison because of it. And when I had first met this pastor, this particular pastor, he had just come out of prison, and he was he, he he was fresh out of prison, but he wanted to get his life back on track. And he was studying uh, to be a pastor, and he's a pastor, and he's he's a pastor at a pretty large church today. And but both of these guys have a similar story. That they both got to what they hit, what called rock bottom. They got as far down as they possibly could go, and they just knew that this was no longer going to be the life that they were going to live. And they turned and they found that their source of strength was in the Lord. And they completely turned and got into the fight. They both made the decision to fight and to draw their strength from God. <clears throat> now, Samson, and we all have, we all have different issues. We all have, we all have things in our lives that could potentially draw us away from God. We all have things in our lives where sometimes the fight becomes so much. And it doesn't even have to be as dramatic as, as an addiction or, or, or some, kind of a thing, some kind of thing that we would consider a dysfunction. It could be anything. But we have to ask ourselves where we draw our strength from. Samson is a familiar person from the Bible. 
Samson had great strength from the Lord as long as he didn't cut his hair. See, because Samson was what they call a Nazarite from birth, which means that he was living under a vow to be separated, to be set apart for the Lord. Now, this is a provision that God had given to Moses, and this is all written down in Numbers chapter 6. And the Nazarite vow was to be for a certain period of time in a person's life. It wasn't meant to be for a lifetime, but for Samson, it was. Part of the Nazarite vow was that during the period of separation to the Lord, that the person wasn't to cut their hair. If they did this, it would mean that their time of separation was over. So the entire time, and it was a few, there was things that they were supposed to abstain from. You know, they were supposed to abstain from, from anything that would make them unclean. They were supposed to abstain from being defiled by a dead body. They were supposed to abstain from certain kinds of foods. They were supposed to uh, abstain from from various activities. And one of the things was that they weren't supposed to cut their hair. Their hair, is, that was, that was kind of signified their period that they were set apart. They were separated for the Lord's use. That this was a special vow that they had made for the Lord, to the Lord, and that they were going to be set apart. But Samson was a little bit different. Samson was an exception. His parents who had trouble conceiving, they prayed to God, and, and part of their prayer was that if God would give them a child, that they would separate him. They would, they would set him apart for the Lord's use. So his parents made this vow for him at the time of his birth and raised Samson as a Nazarite, dedicating his entire life to the Lord. And Samson knew that he was not to cut his hair. And that his great strength from the Lord, as long as his hair was not cut. Now, in this time of Israel's history, they were under the rule of the Philistines. Now, after Joshua had brought the Israelites into the promised land, the Israelites continued to drive the other nations out of the promised land. God had set up judges to rule over the Israelites. And during the time of the judges... Israel would go through periods where they would walk away from the Lord. Israel had this thing, and you can see this throughout the Old Testament, where God you know, calls his people together and, and sets them up. When they went into the promised land, they were, they were going in. They were you know, ready to fight. They were going to go dry out. This was the land that God had promised them. They're going into this land. They're fighting, and then they get into the land, and they start to settle in. And they start to get you know, a little prosperous, and they start to turn away from the Lord. So what would happen was God would kind of like take his hands off, and then the other nations would come and overtake the Israelites, and they would become subject to their rule. And we see this back and forth, especially in the book of Judges. It happens back and forth, back and forth. Then they would cry out to the Lord, and the Lord would respond to their cries and raise up a judge to free them from the rule of these foreign nations. Now Samson was one of these judges that God had raised up. And at this time, they were under the rule of the Philistines. The Philistines were a constant bother to the Israelites. And Samson had continuous battles with the Philistines, and they wanted to capture him. I mean, can you imagine you have this one-man army out there, you know, like, like getting into your business and... and, and and destroying things and, and causing all kinds of problems. If you're, well, we take out this one Israelite and our problems are solved. We can rule over the rest of them. And part of Samson's life, the people from Judah, his own people, who were being ruled by the Philistines, they came to Samson. 3,000 rulers of Judah came to Samson and said, hey, look, you're causing all kinds of problems. Don't you know that we're under the rule of the Philistines? You know, we've got to kind of like... Be nice to these guys. So they handed Samson over. But once again, when Samson got within the presence of the Philistines, God came upon him and he took him out. So they're trying to get rid of Samson. And the Philistines, they needed to know the source of Samson's strength so that they could neutralize him. Now Samson, 
He had a flawed character. He had very poor taste in women. And he always seemed to go towards Philistine women. He always seemed to have a, a, a taste for, he stayed away from his own kind. He, he would go to these Philistine women. Delilah was one of these Philistines. After he falls in love with Delilah, the Philistines come to her and offer her money to discover and reveal to them the source of Samson's great strength. So whenever she would ask him what the source of his great strength was, he'd make something up. He would make something up that sounded plausible, and this happened like three times. And each time, you know, she had men hanging out, waiting for Samson to, so she could subdue him and did what he said that would weaken him, and every time Samson would break out. Well, finally, she got tired of this, and she began to... To, to nag him and say, you know, say things to him like, well, how can you say that you love me if you won't confide in me? You have this great strength, but you won't tell me what the source of it is. But I could imagine from Samson's point of view, because every time he tells her something, she wakes him up and says, the Philistines are upon you. You know, she's always like setting him up. So he doesn't want to tell her, but she got to, they got to the point where he just had no fight left in him anymore. So he tells her everything. So the Philistines overtook him. They gouged out his eyes. Nice group of fellas. Um, I mean, they bound him, they shackled him, and they put him in prison. But even after all of this, Samson continued the fighting when the opportunity presented itself. So as we saw in, in our scripture passage today, all the rulers of the Philistines were gathered at the temple to offer sacrifices to their God. Because everything in the Old Testament, all the people say they attribute things to their God. So the fact of the matter, it's kind of, it was kind of the old adage that like my God is bigger than your God. That was the, that was the way they presented things. And they thought, you know, the Philistines put great faith in their God who was a false god. And the Israelites, of course, they, you know, they kept turning away from their God, the God, the creator of the universe. And at this point, they figured, you know, they got Samson, they took out the Israelites, their God was a superior God, they took care of that because, you know, if their God, if Samson's God was bigger and better, then they would have never been able to Subdue them. So their God must be bigger and better. So they, all the rulers get together and come into the temple and offer sacrifices. And then, being the nice sporting people that they are, they figured they'd bring Samson out to entertain them. Now, Samson wasn't there to do like a tap dance and a song. You know, it wasn't that kind of entertainment. Because remember, Samson is blind at this point. They gouged his eyes out and they set him into prison and he's in prison like, you know, pounding out wheat. So the way they entertained themselves, the way they, 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 what they did with Samson because he was blind, was they bring him out, they put him in the middle of the temple and they put a whole bunch of things in his way and, and they see if he could walk around. So, you know, imagine this guy, this big guy, this big strong guy who can't see anything is walking around tripping on stuff. This is what they did for amusement. This is what they did. So at the point where they were, were, you know, gave him a break, Samson just asked the guard to put his hands against the, the temple pillars that supported the temple. And the scripture tells us that Samson's hair began to grow back. Because here's the thing. The cutting of the hair, his strength was not in his hair. His strength was in the Lord. But he... The Lord left him because the vow was broken. The, the hair, he allowed his hair to be cut. And it was, it was signified that the, the time, the period of, of separation was over. So his strength was gone because the Lord had left him. Because he ended his vow with the Lord. But now he let his hair grow. And his, the Lord was with him again. So they put Samson against the supporting pillars of the temple. 
And basically, these are big wooden columns that are basically being held in place by the weight of the roof of the temple, which people are on top. They said like 3,000 people are there. Samson prays to the Lord to be with him, and Samson was able to push these pillars out and collapse the whole temple on everybody. But Samson was also willing to sacrifice himself so that he could take care of these Philistines. Samson continued fighting to the end. He never gave up, even under the circumstances that would have done most people in. But Samson knew that his strength came from the Lord. By allowing his hair to be cut, he gave his power over to his enemies. He wanted to please Delilah, and so instead of drawing strength from the Lord to overcome the pressure of Delilah's nagging, he gave up the fight and gave it to her. By doing so, he was drawing strength from the peace he received by relieving himself of Delilah's nagging and not from the Lord. We all have our breaking points. These are the times when we must really rely on the Lord and draw our strength from Him. It could just be the pressures of the day. It could just be the daily grind. You know, we, we, we could just, just, you know, sometimes we're just going and going and going and going like we never, I never seem to get a break. And it could just wear you down and you just, you start to burn out and you just have no fight left in you. We, we must rely on the Lord when we reach our breaking points, but we must rely on the Lord for our strength at all times. When we began this series, we looked at Paul, what Paul written to the Ephesians about being in the fight, and how Paul told the Ephesians that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the devil's schemes, against spiritual forces in the heavenly, heavenly realms. And now I know this may be hard for some of us to understand. It may even be hard for some of us to accept. We may not like to think about supernatural things. But here's the thing. Jesus himself told us that these things are real. Jesus drove demons out of people. Jesus also told Peter that Satan had asked to sift him like wheat. This was like right after the Last Supper and and, you know, Jesus was talking about his impending death. And, and Peter is, you know, like all big and proud. And like, well, I, they might all deny you, but I never will. And I'll be with you and I'll fight. You know, and it was Peter. And Jesus is like, listen, Peter. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. So you need to pray. You don't need to be proud. You need to pray. So if Jesus acknowledges these things, then I'm going to acknowledge them as well. And here's the thing. The devil's scheme is a simple one. It's to drive people away from God. And he will use whatever means are available to him at the time. So here's the thing. We're in this fight. But the fact of the matter is, if we're not effective, then we might have peace in our lives. <clears throat> And I know this might sound a little backwards, but the fact of the matter is, it's like, because a lot of people come to the Lord with this, this thought that everything will be easier from this point on. You might hear a message of life enhancement and think, well, from this point on, if I just say this prayer and give my life over to Jesus, everything's going to be fine. It's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. But that's not the case. The more effective we are for the Lord, the more the attacks will be coming towards us. And a lot of us are going like, well, hey, if that's the case, then you know what? I want to keep my distance. Maybe I don't want to be that effective. But where are we drawing our strength from? Are we drawing it from the peace? Or are we drawing it from the Lord? Because here's the thing. Satan wants to capture you. He wants to bind you and he wants to imprison you. When you reach your breaking point, when you get to the place where you feel it is easier to give up and to give in than it is to continue in the fight, 
Where are you drawing your strength from? There are so many distractions these days. And there are any number of ways that we can use to escape the fight. But we are in the fight. It's unavoidable. So the question remains, where will you draw your strength from? God uses flawed people to do his work. Samson was flawed. Women were his weakness. We are all flawed. We all have weaknesses. We all get involved in things that we even know in our hearts that are probably not good for us and we should stay away from. But God still wants to use us to do his work and fight his battles. If you draw your strength from the Lord, he will help you to overcome the things that come against you. You're in the fight. The question then becomes, are you ready to continue to keep fighting till the end? Let me pray, please. Lord, we come before you today and we know that we're in this battle. And some may feel this battle more strongly than others. Some of us here today may be right in the thick of the battle and say, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Some of us may be a little distant from the battle. We might have fought our fights and maybe taking a little break right now. But the battle is still raging. The fight is still on. Lord, give us strength. Help us to draw our strength from you. Help us to know that when we have everything coming against us, when we just seem that we can't get a break, that these are the times, these are especially the times that we need to pray. Lord, help us to always have an active prayer life. Help us to always be in communication with you. But help us to draw our strength from you and from you alone. And help us to stay in the fight. And to continue fighting until the end. Lord, we give you our thanks and we give you our praise in all things. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.